the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, FIL Responsible Entity Australia Limited, AFSL 409 340, ABN 33148 059 009 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hello everyone, Jamie McIntyre here. This ensemble series is all about the great wealth transfer. Throughout this series, you'll get insights from planners in our community and the team at Fidelity who have produced significant research on the great wealth transfer. I'm sure you will enjoy this series and get a greater understanding of how you can help in the great wealth transfer. Fidelity has been investing globally for their clients for more than 50 years and 20 years here in Australia. With one of the world's largest investment research teams, they conduct more than 20,000 company meetings each year to uncover unique investment insights that others may miss. Fidelity offers a range of Australian, global and regional managed funds and you can also access their investment expertise through our active ETFs on the ASX. Invest with local insights, powered by global strength. Welcome listeners to episode three, Estate Planning Without Lawyers in today's Ensemble podcast. Today, I have two guests with me. Uh, Our first guest is a financial planner. Her name is Tanya Carlson. Tanya has been a planner since 2006 and is currently director at Amplify Wealth Management. Uh, And I'm looking forward to speaking with Tanya today and hearing all about her experience in the estate planning space where I have little experience. Uh, Also on today's podcast, our guest is Simon Glazier, Simon's head of wholesale at Fidelity. Simon joined Fidelity in March 2020 and is responsible for leading the sales and distribution team efforts of Fidelity International across the Australian wholesale market. Fidelity has been doing a lot of research in the area of the great wealth transfer, and there's a bunch of reports that Fidelity have put out around that. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from you, Simon, about those today and how that intertwines with estate planning for the planners. Welcome to today's podcast, Simon and Tanya. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Great to have you both here. Um, I think a good question to start off with today is, is for you, Tanya. Um, you work in the estate planning space and do that pretty well. Tell us a little bit about the impact of engaging clients throughout the whole of the estate planning, not just financial planning for them, but how do you go about engaging your clients in the full estate planning process? Yeah, thanks, um, Jamie. It's it's an interesting one. I'll, I'll sort of go backwards and say that I probably didn't really understand the impact of estate planning when I was first a planner, a lot of a lot of planning words going on in that sentence. But um, um, I think what I mean by that is that you don't realise some of the issues that come up until you start to see all sides of the um, you know the picture, which is talking to people about their estate plan, but actually then having clients pass away and seeing that be passed down, um, and then understanding the impact of of the plans that have been made. Uh, so I think it's really important for people to start discussing it with their clients early because it's it's a hard thing to talk about and the more you do that the easier it becomes and then you can start to really use examples of where you've been able to show them why it's so important to start talking about it and it's a complex world now so it's not just for wealthy families to have these complex structures it's probably for everybody yeah absolutely and and in your experience Tanya Look, I think lawyers are seen as the experts uh, in the estate planning space, which is which is probably a true statement uh, when it comes to uh, documenting people's wishes and and doing that in a legal way. Lawyers don't tend to have an understanding of the money and the impacts that money has on the way through the estate. Is that the same experience that you've had, uh, Tanya, that without combining the financial planner in the process the money starts to land in the wrong places for everyone? 
Yeah, it really does. And the lawyers do a wonderful job. So they're really important um, piece. Uh, we can't draft those documents. But most of them who specialise in that space do a fantastic job of really asking good, deep questions. The problem is that they're asking those questions of the providers of this sort of amount of money that's going to transfer at, without understanding the financial position of the receivers or the beneficiaries of those monies. And we recently had, uh, just literally before Christmas, a couple of cases where the beneficiaries were impacted because the beneficiaries themselves in these two examples were both on Centrelink. Um, we're certainly going to have some you know, um, issues with eligibility based on the inheritance that they were receiving. But as planners, we, we know there's a couple of strategies out there where we can minimise that um, and, and try and help them retain their Centrelink benefits. But what was the predominant issue in both of these cases was that the clients themselves so wanted to gift the money to their adult children. So grandma, grandpa had passed away, left it all to adult child, which is fairly normal in most cases, and said to adult child, you, you'll know when to help out the grandkids. I haven't written anything specific in there just in case they're not at the right age or being responsible, but please make sure something goes to them. Um, but by gifting, they're certainly going to have to follow Centrelink's rules for what that looks like. And then that that has caused them more, more angst and more issues than actually the inheritance that they've received. So had they sat down with a planner in the room when grandpa designed his will, um, maybe had a conversation about what his wishes were, there's, there's lots of other things that could have been done to help everybody in the right way. Yeah, that's an interesting one in the sense of um, uh, we've all experienced, I think this is planners that um, many clients, particularly in the current retirement um, era, I suppose you'd say, uh, are, yeah. pretty keen, are pretty keen to get a dollar of pension as a minimum and receive the healthcare card. And, and once they've had that, they're not real keen on losing it, are they? No way. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Simon, tell us a little bit about Fidelity's research around the great wealth transfer and, and how Fidelity sees the, the next decade uh, looking at some of the research. Um, it's expected that $3.5 trillion is going to pass from older generations to younger generations this decade. Tell us a little bit more about the research, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. I, I think in short, we surveyed in partnership with our research partner, My Mavens, about 1,500 Australians over the age of 26 to really try and understand, you know, some of the other considerations about this great wealth transfer. And in the context, I suppose how we kick this off, in the context of the world that we're living in today where, you know, mortgages are quite high, um, cost of living is obviously key and front of mind. When you talk about and start thinking about that generational wealth transfer, we were thinking about, well, where is the destination for this? And both from the, and Tanya, you mentioned this as well, but both from the lens of the giver and also from the lens of the recipient, because quite often what we found is they don't necessarily match up. But one of the key points that we did find throughout, and, and there's probably more than what we could cover today, but to keep it relevant, is that sort of four out of five participants of the survey believe that passing on yeah, a benefit to the next generation is extremely important, but less than 50% actually were comfortable or had a, were confident in the ability and, and understand how to do that effectively. And, and again, Tanya, you mentioned this as well, but what we, what we sort of extracted from the survey was that the legacy people were willing and wanting to leave is, is so much more than just money. And so some of the complexities around estate planning often involves continued engagement with the receivers and the beneficiaries and the families in general, not just what's spelled out in a legal document, right? So, yeah, there's a, there's a heap in there, keen to explore, but that's that's one sort of key takeaway and, and key point for mine. Yeah, I think the the research tells us with those statistics um, that, that people are willing to have these conversations, but potentially we're not connected well with the lawyers and the financial planners and bringing all the right people into the room. Yeah, and, and even if we think about, and, and again, what came through, there's differences in the generations, you know, the boomers versus Gen Y versus Gen X, et cetera, and there's cultural differences as well, both in terms of, you know, how much value they put on a legacy and their awareness or understanding of how to pass on that legacy. Um, 
But one of the things that uh, that we that we that we did find out is that Gen Ys actually would make great advice clients. They're willing to engage, and one of the you know one of the I suppose anecdotal takeaways for me is Gen Ys have largely been uh, observing their their baby boomer parents receive advice and benefit in retirement. You know their standard of living and quality of life in in retirement, so they feel more inclined to seek assistance from a financial planner in the survey financial planners were second in line behind lawyers to seek advice around estate planning so i think the perception you know you go back 15 years versus today is very different of financial advice uh, and the profession absolutely yeah and i, I think the gen wise uh, as you mentioned have um have have observed their parents receiving advice but uh, the advice or the planning industry planning profession has grown from being a sales industry to uh, making a real difference in people's lives in, in a much broader way than just the financial product. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, financial products are a very important part, but the planning well and truly comes in front of the uh, products these days. Correct. Um, Tanya, in working with lawyers for you, and I suppose it's the depth of relationship that a lawyer has um, we we as planners have a very deep relationship. I can speak for myself and most of the planners that I know um, have very deep relationships with our clients. So we understand uh, some things like their cultural differences that, that Simon mentioned. Uh, we understand pretty deeply what's important to them. Um, how can we get together with lawyers to either pass over that depth of relationship or how can we work with lawyers to, to make I suppose, to make this wealth transfer more effective for the recipients? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think um, most financial planners that work collaboratively or holistically with their clients will have relationships with other professionals that we're used to dealing with regularly, accountants, mortgage brokers. Um, lawyers are no different. They also, and definitely in the estate planning space, they would generally want to collaborate with financial planners. So, I mean, I, I would strongly recommend that most financial planners reach out to some of the estate planners in their local area. It makes more sense, but but wherever you find them um, and sort of, you know, catch up and have a discussion about what's needed and how that lawyer operates uh, and ask some of those questions. You know, my client might need extra handholding or my client's got some complexity but isn't recognizing it. How would you unpack that? Or can I be involved in the conversation or can I send you written notes beforehand? Like any relationship, the more you're talking and communicating, you'll find the people that resonate. I work with a number of different estate planning lawyers and like every relationship, you tend to sort of try and match the right one for the client, even to the degree where if someone needs someone who's going to be firm, um, you'll be looking for someone who's perhaps a little bit more structured in their meetings and personality maybe than someone who's that real warm, fuzzy hand-holding. Um, but I think the more you pick up the phone and say, this is a story, my client knows they need help, there's some real issues here to be unpacked and I think that they really need some strong legal advice here, but this is what I've identified. How does that resonate with you? They're going to tell you what they would do next and then you're going to know if that sits right. Yeah, and I, I think bringing the professionals together um, – we have our blind spots um, yeah. as financial planners, um, and and lawyers would also have their blind blind spots when you overlay that with art as the financial planners, where we can definitely bring some great value to the conversation. Yeah, circling back to your example earlier with the clients that they had an issue with Centrelink, that's a significant issue. There's there's so many more things that clients are impacted with. I had a similar example. We spoke about this uh, prior to recording today. Um, I had an inquiry the other day about a lady, um, not about a lady, it was a lady. Uh, her inquiry was she was receiving a disability support pension. Um, at a high level, she owns her house with her father. Uh, he's 93 years of age. He does have a significant estate that will flow through. Um, so her first question is around losing a disability support pension. Um, what we identified through uh, a couple of phone calls was the house is actually owned uh, as tenants in common. So rather than joint tenants, 
Mm-hmm. So we sent her off to get a deeper understanding of her thoughts are that house will end up being mine. But as we know, under a joint tenants contract, that means it automatically goes to her. It still has to come to her via the will and the estate. And that certainly holds some risks as well. So there's going to be this back and forth um, between her father, which is not is going to be interesting for her to find all that out. And we're just in the middle of that. And I'm really curious to learn so much more today on how I might handle that as well from you, Tanya. I'll, um... <laughs> just put me on the spot there. Um... Oh, no, not right now. <laughs> I'll, gi- I'll give you some time on that. I think I think we'll uncover more about that as we go. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, Jamie, just to just to maybe touch on that point, and again, there's data in the survey that really supports that, right? In terms of the service gap, uh, if we think about this generational wealth transfer, one of those is definitely the mediator role. Uh, and and the, and in my view, and again, the feedback from the survey is that the financial planner and the financial planning uh, profession have a real opportunity to play that mediator role. And and again, a part of that is education. You know, diff, again, different generations and different either the the giver or the the beneficiary probably need different educating at different times. But it's still a very important point that was that was sort of extracted from the survey. Yeah, that is that is a great point. Where uh, honest players do lots of mediating along the way. Usually, it's with husbands and wives. Um, <laughs> but in this case, you're right. We're probably very well placed to sit in the middle and bring the two parties together and, and work through those conversations with some really good questions. Probably the challenge that, that may come out of that and one of the, again, the observations, the destination for a lot of the the, the, the wealth transfer is at the paying down of the debt. So we know advice fees have gone from asset-based to more flat or tiered structures based on individual circumstances. So that encompasses the opportunity to include more things like you know, being the mediator or playing the mediator role. But again, just want to call that out because it is something that's, you know, part of the change process that's in play. Yeah, how, do you char- right. how do you charge for that value add, right? Yeah, it's a, well, we're going down a, a different rabbit warren now. Um, <laughs> when we think about that and, and some of the constructive uh, financial advice fees and uh, generally they're linked to an outcome of an SOA, this what we're talking about today is not necessarily sitting in an SOA space. It is just bringing conversations together to figure it out. Yeah, I think that's right. Actually, when when we've we've had a couple of um, clients over the years where we have identified in that initial meeting a real estate planning issue that has been complex in in the two things scenarios I'm thinking of for the family, the significant wealth. Um, and the other client I'm thinking of was one that actually had a disability. And we engaged with um, a particular lawyer who is very good in person and very good at the collaboration and involving us in the meetings. Um, and so what we had done in those examples had built that into our upfront fee. Um, so the estate, the, you know, the SOA says, yes, address your estate planning issues. But we knew there was probably two meetings um, that were going to involve bringing the lawyer along, getting the family together in those conversations and then actually executing. Um, so I think when you start to zoom out and, and most planners are looking at everything holistically, but we also get to this thing like, oh, let's just get it done. But actually you've got to kind of understand that you're going to be addressing these sorts of things and then you're going to be addressing that and you need to sort of maybe, if that's your model, charging up front and ongoing, um, build that into one or the other parts of that so that you actually get it done. Because I think we're just as guilty as getting busy and then thinking, oh, I'm not going to get paid for that anyway. I'll just send an email with a, a lawyer's name and details and the client, it's on the client then. But it's actually really important. And you'll know the ones where they're more complex and they really need you to be there. But I think the more we're starting to do this work, the more we're realizing that it's almost every single client um, that we could be building this into. And one of the things we're looking at, which I think was maybe one of your topic points of discussion, was that there are a lot of online estate planning um, facilities available that advisors can do. I think it's like a half a day course. You sign up and pay a subscription model. You fact find for the lawyers, which we already do. So you don't really have to do too much there. You send that work in the lawyer will have a meeting and you can be involved with the clients always online. They will then draft the documents, give the legal advice in that meeting and then, you know, some clever way witness. We haven't 
done that yet because we've actually, when we started to go down that path, realized that we probably need a bit of a dedicated team to to work that back end, gathering that information, the right format and setting that in, et cetera. But it's definitely something that's on our radar in the next 24 or 12, 12 months um, because I think that it's it's just becoming more and more and more of a conversation point. Yeah, so so right now you're working with uh, their lawyer um, directly rather than taking the full process on. Yeah, and I don't think the full process is always for everyone. There are times when it just gets too complex and you might want to have that lawyer relationship as well that you um, keep. We, we had a client last year that we did, we got the lawyer in, um, did the meeting where we were a part of that and the client had nominated her or wanted her children to be enduring power attorney, enduring guardianship and one of the children wasn't 18. And so we had to come up with, and the, the client was very uncomfortable with not having both of them and so we sort of had to come up with a plan where 18 months later when the child turned 18, we triggered that conversation to get those people back in the room again and re-sign all those documents in the way that she wanted. So not every estate plan it's sort of let's deal with it now and tick it off the list and never see you again. They can be an ongoing collaboration where things will change and the lawyer needs to be evolved um, as part of that. Yeah, and that, and the addition, well, I suppose the suppose part of you commented before that we all uh, we all get a little bit used to clicking out an email and not worrying about charging for that, and I, I think that's part of the evolution of where we've come from and. Um, and and being paid in other ways in the past. Um, but it is really important to be quite explicit with your clients that this is going to be, this is likely to be um, a significant project that we're working on um, and be really clear with them and upfront about what the fees are likely to look like. So there's no surprises. And then you're not sending emails for free. Exactly. I think we're getting better at it, aren't we? We're charging for first meetings. We're charging for other work that we do. So I think we're we're all conscious of it. It's just making it part of your routine. Yeah, absolutely. And Tanya, you I mean you, you touched on a really good point there. And again, of the respondents, you know, at least fifty percent had experienced something that made the situation more complex or forced a revisit of the legacy plan, right? So as you say, it's not a set and forget kind of scenario, but it needs constant review. Yeah, it really does. And that's I think that's, again, where our job comes in because we see our clients every year. So you might have got this beautifully complex, amazing testamentary trust structure and all these things going on, but your clients are sitting in front of you every year telling you that this has happened to that child, this one's getting divorced, this one's had this, you know, happened in their lives. And, and you start thinking, oh, my goodness, this is actually going to have an impact on everything that we've already got going on. Anyway, so we are the people that are, are pivotal, uh, pivotal in in sort of having that discussion, saying, "Oh, do we want to address this now, or is this something we just need to keep an eye on and see how it plays out? And maybe if this and this happens, we're going to have to loop your lawyer back in mm-hmm. and make some adjustments." And that's what they want. They want that um, that help and that guidance. I think across all of the planning sphere. Um, particularly the word planning, it's it's ongoing all the time. Um, it never stops. Yeah. It never stops. Yeah. So one of the one of the key points here is we're perfectly placed to do eighty percent of the planning and lawyers to execute. I think we've covered that off in some degree there, Tanya. Yeah. Let's talk. Uh, Simon, how are you placed to talk about the additional revenue opportunity for clients from a, I suppose, from the reports perspective then? Yeah, I mean, really the points that, that came out was around the service scale, right, which is the mediation, which we've talked about, question around how you charge for that. The risk is that move away from asset-based fees because the assets may not end up in the wealth industry, may not end up in wealth portfolios. So that's probably, you know, something to be aware of and one of the risks if, if, if pricing models don't change, but they, they clearly are. Uh, that some of the outcomes of fidelity is we'll use the term outflows, but that's just part of what's going to play out over time. And uh, I suppose this report makes us all aware. And as you commented, the the wealth industry, um, there'll be less funds. There'll be funds that flow out, but there'll be funds that funds that flow in from other areas as well. 
Yeah, and and in general, I mean, uh, Australia is a wealthy country and only getting well wealthier. Really, I think our peak working population starts to change over the next five to ten years. I think we end up, you know, we we move from having more workers in the workforce and then those supporting it in in that period between that five to ten year period. But um, you know how much equity markets return. Yeah, I think there's a, there is you're right. There is a there is a consequence of flows over the, the longer term. But the other aspect to consider is, you know, what historically was in the realms of a family office, now has huge benefits for non-family office clients, uh, which is probably where that other opportunity exists for financial planning is just to broaden the the set of you know set of services that that you take to 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 mum and dad or families that wouldn't necessarily qualify with their own family office. Yeah. And I think um, as well, you know, Simon, you mentioned that maybe some of that wealth transfer goes to the next generation and they're putting it towards the mortgage. Um, That is a planning opportunity because if they don't have a mortgage now, you would imagine there's more surplus income to be directed to something else. And then what's that something else? So I think, again, planners have an opportunity. Yes, there will be some people that maybe weren't working and and it got them out of a pickle. Um, But I think we're getting so much better at sort of talking to people about their 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 behaviours around money and what the impact will be if they don't have a mortgage but they've got yeah. that surplus is is another discussion piece. Yeah, um, transferring the non-deductible debt, getting rid of that and using debt to grow wealth, absolutely. And and you know, one again one of the um the themes of the the transfer of a legacy that isn't related necessarily to money is education, uh, and that's funding the education of the grandkids and whatever else. So there's, you know, what again historically was in the realms of family office, but Tanya, you mentioned it right that the tax structures, the trusts, etc., that are now really in demand and and useful for pretty much the average Australian. And I think that's it, where we where the clients aren't aware of the way they can structure things or the products even that can help them. And so that's, again, where we can have those conversations. So the estate planning conversation can be an opportunity to bring in the kids and involve them because often, and and I'm sure your research showed this, often um, some of the uh, providers of those financial legacies are nervous about (laughs) the kids getting this money. Oh, they're spenders and what are they going to do with it? And, um, you know, I don't want them to waste this opportunity. Um, that's where we start saying we'll get them in now and we'll start talking to them, we'll start an education process and we'll start working towards the plan in advance. You might have 20 years left, but um, if if we're starting to guide them now, you know, there might be more confidence in that. Um, and then there's also the fact that people are wanting to help their kids while they are alive. Correct. Um, you know, which is an absolutist, uh, you know, planning opportunity to sort of say, well, what is the impact going to be to you um, mm-hmm. if you start gifting money? Um, yes, it brings joy uh, and and wonderful appreciation generally from everybody, but um, it could also have problems. So how are we going to talk about that? Yeah. And in the research, there's a, I mean, the, you touched on some really good points there. Uh, the, the, the passing on of a legacy with warm hands is definitely, you know, high on the High on the priority lists, um, but then also the division, right? The how do you how do you uh, allocate that legacy? And quite often, the default, what we found, the default was equal, yeah. even though the individual situation of the beneficiaries yeah. was very different. Yeah. To kind of to kind of avoid any family conflict, it was just really the decision around an equal distribution of. Of, of the legacy, and again, that may or not be the right thing to do, but but that that assisting with that family conflict is another area of high of high importance, absolutely. And one thing that we probably um, haven't touched on was a key a key item throughout the survey and the others that we've completed along retirement was, you know, the nest egg mentality is alive and well with Australians. Uh, and you know, I, I think about okay, well, what does that mean? Well, what it shows is that when when we start our retirement journey, we think we don't have enough. We're we're paranoid about running out of money, um, but then once we realise we we can we can build a comfortable life in retirement, we we kind of really rate in our spending to build up a nest egg to pass on through a legacy. And it's a really and it's different for every person, 
and different for every situation. But understanding that up and kick in is really important because education leading into retirement is really important uh, and managing that expectation around what you can do in retirement and what you should expect in retirement helps manage that nest egg mentality for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think you covered off on on a couple of really key things there, uh, Simon. Look, in my experience, uh, the greatest question that I ask in this space to open clients up to have these discussions, particularly about nest egg mentality, and you, you use the word warm hands, um, I like to ask the clients, would you prefer to give some money to your children with warm hands or a cold heart? Mm-hmm. Um, and just give them a moment to think about that and, and and let them make that decision. And more often than not, they'd prefer to give some with warm hands. Look, uh, uh, there's uh, there's a few layers of education. We need to educate the 65-plus-year-olds about how much money they have and if we chop off a bit here and there along the journey between now and age 90, um, uh, demonstrating to them that they're still going to be okay. Um, and then by bringing the children in, which was something you started to talk about, Tanya, or the Gen Wires into the conversation for the relevance to this, is bringing them in and starting to even educate them about things like testamentary trust. They yeah. probably have no experience in it. They have, their experience is maybe hearing mum and dad talk about, oh, we've got this trust structure, so we pay less tax. Um, so, you know, taking that opportunity or, or providing information to the Gen Ys on the other side of the ledger is really important as well, right? Yeah, that's right. I think most of the clients, and and you would have seen this too, Jamie, where, you know, the clients that know all about this stuff, that especially the young ones, are the ones that have had to go through loss early. So it may have been a parent or a grandparent that they were close to and, and they've had to either unpack a mess um, where there wasn't an, you know, an estate plan or, or something. Um, and or they've they've seen that things could have been done better, and in hindsight, they've learnt that along the way, and said, "Oh God, if they'd done this, we you know we could have avoided that." So, that you know, they're they're the next generation of perfect clients because they're starting to realise that value of advice, and if people had asked the right questions and you know got that information beforehand, things would be easier. But I think you're right. I think they they sort of they know that they've got. They've got opportunity ahead of them as well to to ask more questions and learn so that they can pass that on to their children or, or whoever they're leaving money to if, if that's what they're deciding to do. Yeah, and I, I think that's another good scenario to paint to the retirees or, you know, the, the will makers um, is painting the picture of, you know, do you want your children to have to learn really fast about all of this stuff? And But likely when you're under pressure making decisions, they're not the best decisions, they might be okay, or would you like to give them the opportunity to learn a little bit over time and, and maybe that's leaning back into the project and the a project fee to do that and investing the time with everyone to get that done. Yeah. yeah. It's probably just, a, again, a data point, again, from the research, if we think about willingness to learn, right, because you can try and educate, but, you know, the student has to be willing to learn. If we look across the generations, you know, the question around, are you interested in learning more about your personal finances? 50% of respondents with it in the baby boomer bracket said they were, compared to 85% of Gen Ys. Hmm. So there's already there's already an inclination to want to know more about their personal finances. Uh, uh, Tanya, have you had some experience in your practice where your older clients um, have offered to pay for advice for their children or or wanted to connect you to them, and, and, and how did you make that work? Yeah, we, we've had that on several occasions. I mean, I, I think it's probably one of the greatest privileges. And, and again, I'm always respectful of relationships that some kids will embrace the trusted people that their parents recommend and other kids will want to do it their own way and find their own. Um, so that's fine. You know, we, we, you just got to go with it. But I think our job as coaches and educators is to work with the families. Look, depending on who they are and, and I guess what what we do for them would be depending on whether we charge their children. So for some clients, if they're our, our high-level clients where we're charging them fees and we do a lot for them, we may offer for the kids to come in for an initial conversation with, with no charge and just have a chat to the kids and see, you know, what they might need to be learning about and talk about how the fees work and talk about when it may be appropriate for those to to kick in, et cetera. 
um, for clients that we just have on a sort of a low service level, but they have identified that their kids either are keen to learn or want to learn or, or whatever, we'll always have um, a meeting with them and just sort of uh, either position a fee for that meeting, like an initial meeting. We we would normally char- we charge for any of our meetings um, or decide whether we're going to gift that. We've, we've had meetings with clients where we've then found out they're getting married and we've gone, well, happy wedding present, there's your fee as a as a wedding gift or whatever. So there's, you know, you've, you're you in the control seat of how you charge for that and whether you want to add that on. Because I think, again, what's your offering for those younger families? Like for our business, um, I think we're probably best suited to accumulators and pre-retirees and retirees than that sort of Gen Y at the beginning of their journey. Um, so I'm not sure that I would be able to offer them full service from day one. Um, but I'd certainly be happy to educate them on things and decide whether I needed to refer them to someone who's an expert in that area or keep them, you know, on our, if, ask them if they want to be on our database list or whatever it is to, to receive those newsletters and tidbits of information. So you, you, each, each advisor is going to have their way of how they want to engage with that and whether they want to offer that, I guess. Yeah, and I think it's reasonable to assume the majority of that work and that the younger person space is around education. It's not necessarily, uh, I'll use the word financial advice or gets to the end being financial advice around financial products that generally speaking, very quite focused on the mortgage they have or the mortgage they're going to get. Um, and, well, and yeah, sorry. Uh, you go. I was going to say, we've, we've actually had a couple of young ones come in that have received, and this is where I think we're really at the beginning of this great wealth transfer that have received. So these are grandchildren that have received significant inheritances, which means they've bought a property, they've got no mortgage, they're at the beginning of their careers. So they're starting to, you know, uh, increase their capacity to earn good incomes. And they're sort of saying, what do I do next? So I, I actually think that we're really going to start to see more of these people. There's a lot more money coming through than I think we've seen in the past. And I think it will become more normal to see these people coming in and they won't be asking about what to do about the mortgage. It'll be, they're skipping that, yeah. um, you know, which is a, which is perfect, right? So then they are 30 with no mortgage um, and, and this great career opportunity and you're helping them make some really important decisions because it's pretty easy as we know to just go and spend that money. Um, and these guys have never had that commitment to a mortgage. So they're not as disciplined in that regard. So there's a lot of opportunity to be that educator and advisor all in one from from day dot. Yeah, and and, and the education around financial habits. You know, a mortgage yeah. is, a, is a forced commitment each month and creates discipline to, yeah. a for, uh, in a way, a forced saving. Totally. Um, and and as you mentioned, if if they're going to skip that, there's an opportunity for for educating them and teaching them good habits yep. with money. That's right. So I think that's that's something I think we're going to see more of. And and um, you know that's that's fun, right? That's easy work for us because um, they're great clients to work with. But um, yeah, other than that, it'll either be that side or it'll be that education and guidance point of view, which I think you know we're we're all pretty passionate about in the industry as well, raising that financial literacy and helping people make really good decisions with their money. Yeah, absolutely. We're very privileged to be in a position where uh, people, which we also then call clients, there with us. Well, all of their private information and. I think we're talking about generational things here. Previous generations didn't particularly like doing that. Um, they're, the, they're the harder ones to get it all from. Um, but yeah, we're very privileged with all the information we get, we share uh, with them, share information about ourselves as well. Tanya, the title of today's episode was Estate Planning Without Lawyers. We we spoke about that in some ways um, and well, in many ways, we talked a lot about planning and a lot about the wealth transfer. The, we, we, what we should acknowledge and acknowledge again is lawyers are extremely important to draft the documents. Um, but I think to sum up a lot of what we've spoken about today, there is a well, it's a massive opportunity for the planners with their depth of knowledge of uh, clients around what it is they really want in life. Um, that links back to money and decisions around 
the transfer of wealth related to what people really want, not what a legal document wants, presents a great opportunity for us as planners to deliver great advice, uh, be great mediators in this space, and also be remunerated for that, for that, that amazing and the huge value that we'll deliver in this space. I think for me, um, there is a great opportunity uh, for the great wealth transfer and all the research and the reports that Simon and Fidelity have um, have put out gives us a lot of information that the opportunity is there. And, and I think if, if you want to focus in that space, it, it, it probably be a pretty good place to niche yourself over the next 10 years. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think the report that Fidelity produced is really thorough and you know, could easily be shared with clients um, in your newsletter as a conversation starter. I'm sure those clients that are going to be preparing for retirement or retired um, would read that and sort of say, oh, I read that and that's got something there I wanted to talk to you about. And so that opens up the discussion. So there's just opportunity with that sort of information coming out for planners to jump on board and um, and keep the conversation going. I appreciate the comment and the feedback, team. That's really good. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Absolutely. Um Guys, today it has been great to speak with you both, uh, to ask you questions, uh, to hear your insights, uh, to share a few insights myself, um, and to talk about the great wealth transfer and estate planning without lawyers. And uh, Simon, thank you for your time and thank you, Fidelity, for all the research. Uh, Tanya, thank you for all of your insights from a planner's perspective and um, from a planner who has experience in this space, in the estate planning space, and has a passion for that. And that's today's podcast. Thanks, guys. Thank Thank you. you.